<clears throat> okay, hello. Uh, welcome everyone to this webinar on the role of land certification in securing women's land rights and collective lands. Uh, this webinar is co-hosted by the Research Consortium, the Land Portal, DAI Global Lift, the Center for International Forestry Research, and Associates Research Trust Uganda. I'm Amanda Richardson, co-founder and program director at Resource Equity, which runs the Research Consortium. Evidence shows that women can benefit from having individualized land rights formalized in their name. However, similar evidence is not available for formalization of land rights that are based on collective tenure. Studies have estimated that as much as 65% of the world's land is held under customary collective tenure system. Improving tenure security for land held collectively has been shown to improve resource management and to support self-determination of indigenous groups. But little attention has been paid to the question of whether women and men share equally in the benefits of formalizing collective tenure. This is complicated by the fact that often, even if lands are held collectively, they are sometimes allocated and managed on an individual household basis. So this webinar aims to explore the question under what conditions might formalization of collective tenure improve women's tenure security. Um, in August of 2018, the Research Consortium launched a grant-making program inviting proposals on the topic of the effectiveness of land and resource tenure interventions to improve the lives of women. The three resulting papers cover interventions in Ethiopia, Uganda, and Indonesia, Peru, and Uganda on large-scale systematic land certification to individual or jointly held plots, issuing certificates of customary ownership on lands that are held collectively but are managed on an individual household basis, and formalization approaches on collectively held and communally managed rights to forest land. So for today, I'm gonna to start by introducing the panelists who are some of the authors of those grant-funded research papers. We'll then discuss five different questions for about an hour, and we'll end with 30 minutes for questions from you, the audience. If you have any questions, please post them using the questions feature, and we'll then answer them during that final half hour. So the panelists, um, first we have John Leckie, who is DAI's Global Practice Lead for Land Tenure and Property Rights, and has 20 years of international project experience in the land, natural resources, and environment sectors in Europe, Africa, Central and Southeast Asia, and South America. John has worked as the Senior Registration Advisor in Rwanda on the award-winning Land Tenure Regularization Support Program, and he's currently the Registration Advisor to the DFID funded Land Investment for Transformation Program in Ethiopia, and supports DAI's land tenure and property rights pro projects across the globe. Then we have Ileana Monteroso, who's an environmental scientist. She's currently co-coordinating gender and social inclusion research with the Center for International Forestry Research as part of the equity gender, justice, and tenure team. Her research focuses on gender, community forestry, indigenous territories, tenure, and collective rights, pre predominantly in Latin America with some experience in Uganda, Indonesia, and Nepal. Next we have Paul Indegeka, who's a statistician and has close to four years of experience working in the field of quantitative data analysis at Associates Research Trust Uganda. He has worked to design data capture templates, clean data sets, and build variables to assess the quality of and resultant statistics for their suitability in analyzing gender according to internationally accepted global standards and concepts. Um, finally, we have Herbert Kamusime, who is the Executive Director of Associates Research Trust Uganda and has more than 15 years of experience working on gender, land, and livelihood. He's also a member of the National Land Policy Working Group in Uganda and has worked on gender conscious data collection and analysis tools and to build the capacity of grassroots organizations in monitoring and evaluation. So now I'm going to move on to the questions for the panel, beginning with a question for Herbert. In your experience, Herbert, what mechanisms help to ensure that women's rights are protected equally with those of men in different processes for formalizing land rights? Thank you very much, Amanda. I'm going to talk from insights we've gained working on certificates of customary ownership in Uganda. These, are, uh, these certificates are a tenure transformative tool uh, talked about in the 1998 Uganda Land Act and the, in the National Land Policy. So, straight to your question, Amanda, there are three things I would want to highlight uh, as far as uh, ensuring women's rights are protected probably in equal measure as those of men. First of all is the uh, moving women to become active participants in the formalization processes. We need to make sure women stop being passive beneficiaries and move them to the level where they need to be part of the practical processes that take place in the formalization processes. For the case of customary uh, certificates of customer ownership, 
it's the point at which adjudication takes place. Uh, that is the moment when decisions are made on the names that go on the documents, whether persons are being amalgamated or subdivided. It is critical that women are active participants in such a process. The second point I would like to make is we need to go beyond ordinary sensitization. As we interrogated the data on certificates of customary ownership, we realized that the decisions that are being made as the, as the land gets formalized are life-changing uh, decisions, critical decisions that people cannot backtrack on easily. Therefore, it goes beyond awareness to the need to to, 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 to have knowledge, to, have, to know what is going on, because those are tough choices that are being made and they are going to affect livelihoods for generations to come. The third and last point I would like to give on that is that the policy and legal environment must be right. It is important to do things as per law or policy prescription. Otherwise, you may think you are helping people when you are actually endangering them. For the case of Uganda, with regard to certificates of customary ownership, they are well mentioned in the, the policy and in the law, but there are no land regulations to operationalize those certificates. So people are rotating all over the place, uh, trying to give out these documents, but the proper step-by-step -step mechanism separated in the land regulations is not there. Those are the points I would like to make on that. Thanks, Herbert. Uh, that's some really interesting. I, I think it's really striking. A lot of what you said goes to unintended consequences, um, both with the law and when you're not educating women and communities enough. Um, so, Ileana, I have the same question for you. What mechanisms do you think help to ensure that women's rights are protected equally with those of men in formalizing land rights? Well, thanks, Amanda. Um, well, just to make a clarification, our study differs from the one Paul just discussed because we analyze processes of right devolution to forest. So in some cases, this actually included forest lands, as in the case of Peru, where we analyzed formalization of indigenous communities in the Amazon. But in others, our analysis included processes where rights were not recognized to land, but mainly to forest resources. This is the case of social forestry schemes and partnerships in Indonesia, and also collaborative forest management and community forestry in Uganda. In total, we study seven different reform processes related to forests, but I will draw on some specific examples to discuss the type of mechanisms that emerge from our analysis. First of all, I would like to highlight that participation of women and men in forest tenure reforms differs as it is not only defined in law and policy, but also in communal governance structures, as well as household dynamics. Therefore, we need to look at the factors that favor and hinder equal rights across these different levels. Outcomes on the ground depend greatly from implementation practices. Therefore, the mechanisms should be based not only on clear provisions and laws, but also on clear practices. So having the law is not enough. Reforms should establish goals that indicate clearly how women and different forest user groups will be incorporated in the implementation process and specify clearly how they will benefit. So identifying who is the subject of the reform is one fundamental mechanism. For instance, national laws in the three countries where we uh, did our study often refer to an organized forest user group in practice, this meant that representation is based on household head membership. This influenced greatly how women can participate. As it happened in social forestry schemes in Indonesia, very few women were recognized as former members of these groups. Also looking at the type of rights and how these are distributed within the collective is also another important mechanism. For instance, going back to the case of Indonesia, social forestry recognizes access use and management rights to forest resources. But other reforms, as in the case of collaborative forest management in Uganda, the participation of management is limited and use rights over non-timber and subsistence forest products are the only type of rights that forest user groups um, get. So finally, the mechanisms should include 
um, at a specific sectorial law, clearly determine how this will support gender equity, how they will encourage participation of women in decision making, and the type of changes in attitudes and behavior that the policy will promote. From the three countries that we analyze, the only target forest policies that we found on the ground were forest laws in Uganda, but still the implementation of these policies in practices was still quite limited. Thanks, Eliana. Um, it struck me from what you're saying about this issue of membership, making sure it's disaggregated by gender is something really important when you're talking about collective rights and forest rights. Um, so John, what are your thoughts on what mechanisms help to ensure that women don't control the of men in formalizing land race? Um, thank you, Amanda. Um, so I, I come at this from uh, the perspective of, of the systematic registration of lands, uh, of large scale systematic registration of lands from our work in, in Ethiopia that's, that's described in the paper, but also from our work in, in Rwanda and, and, and Tanzania. Now, in, in, in this situation, you're registering hundreds, perhaps thousands of parcels per day. In Ethiopia, it's as, as many as 25,000 parcels a day. And in that situation, it's, it's not really possible to spend lengthy amounts of time sort of examining each registration. So it's essential to build women's rights considerations into the procedures for registration. So I'll elaborate on this with a couple of examples um, from the field. And, and, and the first example, it, it's, it sort of seems obvious, but it's something which people often get wrong or they overlook. And, and that is to use a, a registration form which is designed to recognize female members of a household. I remember, you know, Her Herbert once showed me a CCRO from, from Uganda, which, um, you know, was only really recording the head of the household and every, everybody else in the household was kind of subsidiary to that. Um, and, and often that's the case. These standard registration forms sort of record the particulars of the head of the household. That's typically a male in a, a husband and wife relationship. And then they record the other members of the household as secondary or subordinate, even when the tenure is claimed jointly. So simply by designing the forms correctly to record the particulars of joint claimants equally, and equally the title documentation or certificates uh, or, or whatever is issued should recognize the names of all title holders. Um, well, equally, we, do, we work uh, on a USA project in Tanzania um, and uh, there they're using a, a, a mobile device uh, called MAST to collect the registration data. So there it's important to make sure that the interface is, is similarly accessible to the sort of paper form that you might use. Um, and I, like, this might not seem like an issue, but you know, to illustrate the importance of, of, you know, of names uh, and, and, and the ranking of names, to use an example from Ethiopia, through our work on, on the LIFT program, we've issued millions of certificates. And largely, these are registering parcels which are uh, uh, jointly registered to married couples. We process the registration certificates in batches of many thousands at a time, 3,000 or 5,000 at a time. And our IT system lists the names of all the landholders in alphanumeric order on the certificate which means that in many cases, the wife's name appears before the husband on the certificate. And we discovered pretty early on in the process that many male landholders were a bit concerned about this. They were feeling that somehow this made them subordinate to their wives in terms of the rights over the parcel. So we managed to address this with, you know, raising awareness that this was not the case, that the rights were recognized equally, and that this was just an administrative issue, but it kind of goes to show how things appear on paper can have an influence on how rights are perceived in reality. Um, my second example, um, uh, again, from, from Lift in Ethiopia, it involves prov providing a resource to support the enhanced participation of women and vulnerable groups in the registration process. This, uh, this is 
has to go further than a few sort of targeted public awareness events and messages and women's only meetings and this kind of thing. In the case of Lyft in Ethiopia, we have a specialized team member called a, a social development officer, an SDO, who works with villages and local authorities to identify women and other people in the community who might be vulnerable to being left behind by the process for various reasons. It might be a, um, a nursing mother who can't attend the registration events or an elderly widow with mobility problems or people who are involved in land disputes. And, and so the SDOs work directly with these people and the wider community to ensure that they're properly represented and they have the right access to the registration services. Thanks, John. Um, those SDOs sound like a really important resource, and I'm hoping to hear more about them when we get to the question and answer section. And speaking of which, if you have questions for those of you in the audience, please feel free to just type them as we're going so you don't forget them. Um, so we've talked about a few different mechanisms that can ensure that women's rights are protected equally with those of men and formalizing land rights. Let's now turn to what lessons, challenges, or questions remain on how to ensure gender equitable outcomes in different processes for formalizing land rights. Herbert, what are your thoughts? Thank you again, Amanda. Um, uh, the lessons, challenges, and questions, uh, I'm afraid they, they, they are a bit many, but uh, uh, let me pick a few things that I think uh, would benefit this uh, conversation. First, like I mentioned in my earlier submission, is the issue of standards. Very many actors, and there are no regulations. So it is very possible, and it is happening, that there are variations in conception, in implementation methodologies, and therefore we don't know whether the outcomes will be the same or will benefit women at the same level as men or even amongst the women themselves. And that, because of the, the, the there being no standard protocol, the issue of opportunistic inclusion and exclusion at the time of in, uh, registration of names is a very real problem uh, or challenge to contend with. Secondly, <clears throat> there are still many conceptual problems around the issue of customary uh, certificates. First of all, we the, the, the lands are not simply customary. They are communal customary lands and they are individualized customary lands. So you, when you look at the, the, the certificates, the uptake of the certificates currently, in the south of Uganda, in Kasese and, the, and Kavale, where customary lands are more individualized, the uptake and the attitude is more positive to these certificates compared to the north, like Gulu, where they, are more, they have more or less uh, not been, they have not gained much mileage uh, uh, in, in this community. So there are conceptual problems around uh, customary lands, even they are not the same. It is communal at certain points and it, then it is individualized at certain points, even when you think about it in the communities like the Karamoja region. The third point I want to make is around the integration of customary and traditional institutions within these processes. Uh, generally in the policy and law, these, at least in Uganda, these are sidelined completely. But then these institutions usually have some residual authority uh, on the ownership of these lands. People claim this is Karamajong land, this is Acholi land. And so this belongs to clan X. It is land for clan Y. So in those circumstances, the issue of the social license becomes very important. And for this particular innovation to take root, it has to avoid pushback. And that is an issue to contend with still. Then the other point I want to make is the, the structure of the family. Sounds a very simple issue, but it is very problematic. especially when you think about polygamy as far as these services are concerned. Do you issue one certificate to, to the polygamous uh, family uh, such that the man, it's in the, man, the, the, the names of the man and, the, and the, the two, three wives, 
or do you break up that piece of land and issue three certificates with the man being the common uh, uh, the person on, on these certificates? Those are still issues that need to be teased out and there are no easy answers. Uh, the other point I would like to make is uh, the issue of secondary vulnerabilities that are coming out of these processes. There, there is a lot uh, that is happening. The motives for giving out the certificates are various, but there are also uh, things that are happening. For example, uh, I'll give an example in Kavale, where the moment the certificates are issued, the, 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 those communities become the hotbed for money lenders, for loan sharks, and things like that. So the, 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 the issuance of the certificates so far has not yet gone to the level of thinking about mitigating uh, the probable and desirable effects that are likely to follow in the in the aftermath of implementing. Thank you. Thank you, Herbert. That was a, a lot of outstanding things to think about. Um, Eliana, do you see the same um, questions and challenges in your work, or what other lessons or challenges do you see with ensuring gender equitable outcomes in different processes for formalizing land rights? Well, thank you, Amanda. I will briefly discuss three lessons and challenges that also relate to remaining questions. And the first lesson from us is that there's no single type of reform that performs consistently better for men or for women. However, what we're seeing on the ground is that these processes of right devolution can actually make a whole lot of difference in terms of influencing an internal debate and how existing rules affect men and women differently and allow new forms of organizing that could actually empower women at the local, local level. The challenge is to ensure that the interventions should be very specific on how we will involve women. And this is not only in terms of how we're convening processes, like how we're designing them, but also other exercises that involve mapping and demarcation processes. And this is very important to avoid the risk of formalizing or perpetuating existing inequalities or ignoring some use practices during formalization processes. The second lesson that we see from our research is that um, four factors are influencing perceptions around tenure security, at least from the seven reforms that we analyze. These include whether respondents were women, what the type of the socioeconomic status that they have, whether their village is actually participating of reform processes, and whether the individual is participating in a forest-related organization. Thus, we can say that indeed the reforms are influencing how women perceive their rights are secured. However, the challenge is that we see is that the sources of tenure insecurity remain and need to be addressed. This includes overlapping rights, the lack of clear boundaries, and this calls for the need to consider conflict resolution during formalization processes. And so also from the study, we have seen that women are quite active in these processes, something that we saw in Peru, so we need to involve them in conflict resolution. And the third lesson that I would like to highlight is that still, since we're talking about forest reforms um, on forests, is that we see that the forest sector continues to be perceived as a men's domain. However, our results highlight that women are quite active and participating not only in meetings around forest management, but actually adopting on the ground management practices. So the challenge that we see is to how to ensure extension services that are available are, and also involving women. Um, and the two activities that we saw where women are quite active, it's in terms of monitoring, but also in terms of management practices. So this, we, we see these two examples as a way to start. And this is quite relevant as this will have also important implications in terms of livelihood improvements, not only for women, but for the whole community. Thanks so much, Ileana. Um, it sounds like a major piece of this might also be considering the heterogeneity of women and ensuring that all women are given support to participate. So, John, we'll now move on to you. What are your thoughts on the lessons, challenges, or questions that remain on how to ensure gender equitable outcomes in different processes for formalized land rights? Thanks, uh, Amanda. Um, again, 
at looking at this through the lens of, of, of large-scale registration uh, uh, activities, you know, a systematic registration process, it might be a great success in terms of, of capturing the correct landholders in a gender equitable way. In, and it's been demonstrated that that is possible. But um, what happens next? Um, you know, people go away with their with their new uh, titles or certificates, and um, then they make transactions. You know, they uh, exchange lands, give gifts, sell lands, they inherit lands, um, and sometimes they do that through formal land administration systems that are recognized by the government. Sometimes they do it informally, they use traditional ways of doing it. Um, there's a, a great deal of, of complexity around that. And are those processes that people are using, are they gender equitable as well? Do we, are we gonna see, um, having captured all of this gender equitable uh, uh, land ownership uh, or these, these land rights, um, are we gonna see the kind of erosion of the register, not just in terms of lapsing into informality, but in terms of women losing out uh, when land transactions are made around inheritance or, or whatever. Um, and so I think the need, there's a need to put in place procedures and support resources that are, that are built into the land administration system or the formal land administration system going forward to ensure that these, the outcomes of systematic registration are, are sustained and maintained with the register. Um, so ideally that would be a position which is akin to the, the social development officer, the SDO that I mentioned earlier, who would be part of the land administration service provision. Um, but I, I can't say that this is always seen as the priority. I mean, Government services are always under resource pressures. Uh, they're always struggling to put fuel in the motorbikes uh, and to keep the lights on. So in, in that kind of situation, typically this kind of position is the first thing, first thing to go. Um, and so I think there's a, there's a need to build some more consensus that it's actually a, a priority position uh, going forward. Thanks. Uh, thanks, John. I'm kind of interested to know if you do have any examples of best practices that have worked for that suggestion. Um, so I'll say again, if anyone has questions in the audience, please send them over and feel free to just send over it on our screen. <laughs> um, so for now, let's move on to our third question. Herbert, in your opinion, what are the most important enabling conditions for achieving gender equity and outcomes? <clears throat> Thank you, Amanda. I, I think the the, the for me, the, the, the most critical uh, uh, enabling condition is rights education. We, we really need to, to move away from superficial awareness creation because the, the People need to engage with these processes. So I, I guess rights education is for uh, number two of prevention to to these meetings. And that one are going to be product the, the issue of the, the social and the, the political commitment, the buying. They are, the so communities have to accept uh, these processes, buy into these changes. Otherwise, you will have pushback or whatever innovation you are putting across as far as uh, achieving gender equity is concerned, we, we, we will not be implemented. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so, thanks, Herbert. So, building on your earlier answers, it sounds like a major piece here is education and sensitization. Um, Ileana, do you agree? What do you think are the most important enabling conditions for achieving gender equity and outcomes? Thanks, Amanda. I will add three enabling conditions to those uh, raised by Paul. Well, the first one is related to one of the issues that uh, Paul mentioned, 
um, we need institutional arrangements. This means, this means have clear rules, um, specific rights that are sensitive to women concerns and needs. So having laws, provisions, rules, as well as norms and customs in place that are inclusive. And these arrangements are important as they enable access, use, and control of forest resources, but also because they're influencing the type of decisions, the collective choices around resources, influencing livelihood strategies, incentives for collaboration, investment, and opportunities. Um, the other point that I would like to raise is that, of course, rights and rules are very important, but, it's, but it's not enough. We need to ensure that those rights gained are secured. So tenure security is fundamental. Rights to lands, but also to forest resources are a key determinant of decision-making process around forests. And finally, we need to ensure the continued support of productive systems and capacities of forest users to outcomes in the long term after issuing certificates, titles, or permits. So this means ensuring livelihoods. Because livelihood concerns are an important aspect associated with the satisfaction of rights, but also of improved tenure security for forest uh, peoples on the ground and for both women and men. And this is linked to ensuring extension, linked to ensuring training, linked to ensure that we are supporting forest livelihoods um, for, the, for the, the people that we're targeting with these reform processes. Thank you. Thank you, Eliana. Um, I think it's interesting how you're kind of talking about the whole life cycle of the reform, from starting with the good laws and customs to ensuring rights are concert, uh, secured to looking at continued support. So turning to John now, what do you think are the most important enabling conditions for achieving gender equity? And uh, I, I very much concur with, with my colleagues. Feedback for 2019. If I was to choose one thing, it would be political will, um, of course, um, underpinned by clear laws and procedures. Um, development partners, I think, who are involved in land rights formalisation, uh, help to drive this political end of year conversation um, for employees is now starting in the Mickleway realm. I think the donors have come a long way in terms of indicators that do more than just sort of count the number of women who attend an awareness event or whose name appears on a land register. Um, and improved land information systems allow us to develop a clearer picture of the patterns of ownership and um, the numbers of parcels and area of parcels, for example, which enable us to monitor whether registered lands are equitably recorded and, and take corrective action if we need to. But, now, this political will and the accompanying laws and policy, they can't just be a sort of top level. They have to in, in, in embrace an element of, of complexity here. Because to give an example related to what Herbert was saying earlier uh, about polygamous households, you know, polygamous households might seem like a minority issue in a country like Ethiopia or Tanzania or Rwanda, but they can, it can cause all kinds of confusion and even disputes, even conflict when the time comes for children to inherit lands from their parents. So having clear guidelines in place which support those complex household relationships like, like polygamous households shouldn't be disregarded and I, I, th I think that you know there's a need for decision makers and policy makers to kind of engage uh, at that level of detail um, in order to make sure that, um, that, that they're serving the pu public in a, in a gender equitable, equitable way. Uh, thanks, John. Um, so I think some of your thoughts there kind of lead us into the next question of what kinds of data are helpful in answering these questions. Uh, so, Paul, can you start us off? Uh, thank you. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the research community as is has a lot of qualitative data, a lot of what has been gathered to assess uh, certification of lands on a large scale is a uh, narrative and less skewed towards numbers and figures if we are to if we are to convince politicians and other action stakeholders and principal decision makers about the importance of certification 
I think it's it's very important to back it with numbers. And then the numbers that we have as is are are for the most part counts of who is of who is written whose name is written where who is included where how many women are on which document. However, I think it's important that uh, we invest in collecting data in the robust evaluation processes that goes beyond counting how many women are there and, and goes down to breaking their, their perceptions and their, their access to that land and all sorts of uh, detail in what they, what they can do and what they cannot do on the, on, with regard to the land in question. This is particularly important. But if you look, if you take a look at our paper, more than 80% of the past was assessed, actually had at least one woman in them. But for the most part, these, these women, these women did not score highly in aggregated scores of the various aspects of completeness of tenure of their, of their rights. Because while their names were on the on the papers, they did not view themselves as owners, which was asymptotic to the custom. Then the variables that are collected when you when you're assessing the effect of an of an intervention should reflect the the interplay of power, uh, the interplay of, uh, of of politics about whose name goes where. And for for our, for our particular case, it was the household. If you if you are assessing an, an intervention like that, the unit of analysis at this point I think should be the household. And again, it should go beyond counting. How many women from this household have their names of children? It should also go into assessing how many of these women can sell, can use that land as collateral, can access the land, can subdivide it, can amalgamate it, can add it to parcels. And if 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 the data from such evaluation process is robust, it gives it gives a great a great opportunity to benchmark and to understand what aspects of the processes work as rights enablers and what don't. That's my that's my contribution. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I'd love to hear more about how the um, But first, Ileana, what kinds of data do you think are helpful in answering this question? Thank you, Amanda. Um, well, one of the things that uh, for us was really important is like the way we're understanding reforms. And for us, you know, it's important to look reforms as dynamic processes that involve not only how they are designed but also how they are implemented. So for this we need to collect information on the formal but also the informal frameworks in place. So this means responding to who's making the rules, who's designing these reforms, who's monitoring and enforcing their implementation, who's taking the decisions and participating in governance structures. And these data exist at different levels. At the national level, we collect information on implementation, but one of the things that we saw from our, from our study is that we also need to understand what happens at the subnational level and understanding the role of the different sectors and the levels of government involved, their skills, their agency to influence decisions and the support they have, the training they have to be able to implement at the local level. We need to understand also the context of the reforms for this, we need to collect information that responds to questions such as who is involved, who is in favor or opposed in these reform processes, and also understand that because this question, the response to these questions will help us to understand better what are the, what are the barriers that women are facing to effectively participate in these decision-making processes. So also understanding what happens on the ground is fundamental if we want to improve implementation practices. So collecting data at the village and household level is key. And this should target both women and men. Uh, they should draw from different methods, qualitative but also quantitative, as Paul was mentioning. And at the household level, doing intra-household surveys is extremely useful. In our case, they allowed us to better understand the existing gaps between men and women. For instance, just to give you an example, of how it was extremely relevant and the type of, of data that we were collecting. Peru was a country that came out as the largest bundle of rights because they were recognizing not only um, rights to forests, but also to forest lands. So they had also the highest percentage of respondents, both men and women, indicating a positive change 
in the perception of improved tenure security. However, when we look at the intra-household data, this revealed, revealed important differences between men and women, showing that women may know the rules, they may consider them as clear, but they do not always consider them as fair in comparison to men. So this level of detail actually help us to understand the type of gender gaps that exist in these processes. Thank you. Thanks, Eliana. Uh, that's great. I think we'd all welcome this kind of detailed data. So John, do you agree? What kinds of data do you think are helpful in answering these questions? Um, I, I come at this from a, bit, a different perspective. Um, and I, so to sort of paint, paint a picture really, it, a couple of weeks ago, uh, our project in Ethiopia demarcated its 14 millionth parcel, so one four millionth parcel. So um, that kind of very rich data is, is very interesting and very compelling. But if you've got 14 million parcels worth of data, it's a massive headache and <laughs> would be a lot of, lot of uh, cost associated with collecting that level of data. So really f f from the perspective I'm coming from, the, the essential thing is to collect um, the data that pertains to people's rights um, and, and the basics which are required to, to, to register persons or register parcels in the name of a person. Um, we, you know, we can pick up, pick out some, uh, some interesting findings from, from that data. Um, and uh, as our land information systems are, are getting better and better, um, as time goes by, um, you know, we're, we're better able to access gender disaggregated data very quickly from the register. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, in Tanzania, for example, we're using this mast mobile device uh, to collect data and that's almost allows us to collect real-time data on, on, on uh, who is registering land. And, and, you know, if we monitor it carefully enough, um, we need to, you know, we're able to take corrective action if we need to, if you find that in certain communities, there's a particularly low uh, turnout of, of one demographic. We can, we can go and look into it and go and examine uh, what the issues might be. Um, this, of course, it has to be registered, referenced against this kind of uh, ordinary monitoring data from field work um, and from public meetings that we hold as a project and so on. Uh, and I think that this this kind of monitoring, it needs to, to continue into the land administration, uh, as I mentioned before, and the register maintenance phase. Um, so somebody within the land administration needs to be mandated to be monitoring and uh, reporting, following up uh, this data. Thank you, John. Uh, so the final question we have here is, what are the next steps for the research community? Paul, what do you think? Um, thank you. First of all, in during um, right now, there is, uh, there is no universally accepted metric of inclusive data to land certification. I think that would be a good starting point. There is no universally accepted metric of tenure security. Those two would be an excellent starting point. Then, having, having done this, having done those, the community can then invest in. Um, collecting data that is in line with the with with these two metrics and the variables collected will go in a great way in understanding what aspects of a certification process works and what what aspects do not work such that uh, future processes can be more inclusive and have more gender equitable outcomes so in addition to this the the research community should uh, should uh, try as much as possible to generate quantitative evidence because our, our experience has been that uh, people in the experience of influence with regard to land administration usually assign resources to or to, to procedures or to report to tasks that uh, that should show up as well as uh, 
data that uh, about certification processes that uh, the, the community needs to collect data about certification processes that actually shows and quantifies outcomes of the, the certification procedures. Lastly, the community should uh, share and uh, publish a lot of uh, information about uh, those that, that, like the plan 10 institute index that I first spoke about. In our paper, we attempted, actually, the program of our, of our paper was uh, to attempt to compose one. And I feel the community should invest more in composing. If we have a, a tenure security index, then we can we can look at all certification processes and have universal accepted metrics to show which one was go a great way in, gui in guiding which one was inclusive and why and which one wasn't and why. And that, well, I, that I think will solve a lot of problems. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And I do hope we are moving towards these kind of read upon metrics. So, Ileana, what are your thoughts on the next steps for the research community? Thanks, Amanda. Well, ongoing reforms need to be informed with practices on the ground. And we believe that the research community can provide information and respond to whether these reforms are promoting women's rights as equally protected with those of men during formalization processes in relation to land, but also in relation to forests or other natural resources. From our work, we observe that reforms are perceived to be completed once the certificates, titles, permits, or authorizations are granted. However, our findings highlight that realization of rights and the sustainability of outcomes derived from those rights is closely linked, first, to the ability to improve livelihoods, and second, to the ability to secure those rights in the long term. For us, participatory action research can contribute in rethinking the role of the state and other external actors as non-governmental organizations and social movements in how this process takes place. Um, and I will mention three specific issues. First, by further understanding the ongoing and existing pressures over resources that are hindering livelihood benefits. Second, identifying the existing gaps in training and supporting skills to improve extension services, like in situations of conflicts, in an inclusive manner. And third, identifying other structural problems of power and inequity that are influencing implementation and outcomes. And as, I, as you mentioned earlier, these uh, inequalities are not only related to whether the targets of these reforms are women and men, they are also related to other dimensions, as the age people have, the ethnicity, the class, the socioeconomic status that are actually impairing the ability of um, forest dependent people to improve their livelihoods, which we think are issues where the community, uh, the research community should be uh, working on in the future. Thanks. Thanks for that interesting response, Ileana. Um, kind of the more qualitative perspective to follow up on Paul's quantitative recommendations. So, John, I'll give you the final word of this discussion. What do you think are the next steps to the research community? Thanks. Uh, I, I have a, a ton of questions uh, for, for the research community, for my colleagues uh, in Ethiopia and elsewhere. I, you know, we know that it's possible now for, for large scale land registration to successfully formalize gender equitable land rights. But so what? My, my questions all relate really to what, you know, what the impacts are um, for women. And in relation to that, you know, what is the behavior change uh, that, is, that is yielding those impacts? So, you know, do those rights that people have got on paper, do they really translate to rights in reality? Or is a woman's name just ignored on a title? Um, do they have more decision-making power in the household? How are women exercising these rights in terms of accessing new opportunities, new resources, or using the land administration system in a way which continues to support and hopefully benefit them. For example, do women rent out land now that they feel more secure in doing so? Do they 
do they uh, are they able to rent out that land for more money? Um, what do they do with this income that they derive from this? Do they set up a shop or do they invest in something else? Um, do women feel more secure in filing for a divorce now that they know they won't lose their land? Um, are they more inclined to marry outside of their community, knowing that their home and family land is, is better protected from encroachment? Um, so really, yeah, all, uh, my questions relate to the changes, and certainly this list is not exhaustive, but the, the changes in behavior that take place after, after this security of tenure is confirmed, confirmed. Do people's lives improve? What are the challenges they face? And, and ultimately, what, what's, the, what's the impact at the end of the day? Thanks. Thanks, John, that's quite a list. Um, thank you to everyone for this. So we've covered a lot of ground already from recommendations around developing and finding metrics on land tenure security, to focusing on laws, consideration, education, and to specific examples of using local resources to ensure women are being included in reform. We have a lot of questions from the audience, so I'm gonna to turn to those now. If you have a question you haven't asked, please send it through the question function now. Um, so I'll start with a little group of questions for all the panelists. Um, what's the role of traditional leaders in supporting women in securing their land rights? Um, and then a similar question, how do women secure their land rights in a context where they aren't recognized as the owner, but as users, and how can they overcome customary and traditional barriers? Um, and then a third question, uh, what's the capacity of the systems and certificates to secure women's land rights in the cases of death, divorce, and inheritance, um, processes that historically dispossess women? So I don't know if one of you wants to leap on that or if I should call on someone. I'm sorry, Amanda. Could you repeat the questions, please? You, you went you went quite quickly there. I was trying to jot uh, them down. Sorry. <laughs> so the first one was, what's the role of traditional leaders in supporting women in securing their land rights? Um, and then we have one from Sophie Ruth. How do women secure their land rights in a context where they aren't recognized as the owner but as users? How can they overcome customary and traditional barriers? Um, and then we have one about the capacity of the systems and certificates to secure women's land rights in the cases of death, divorce, and inheritance, processes that historically dispossess women. Can I, can I take the first question about the role yeah. of traditional yeah. leaders? Um, I, from 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 the point of view of uh, systematic registration, um, you know, everyone in the community has to be involved, um, and that means traditional leaders, and maybe non-traditional leaders as well. People people who are have a, an important role or function in the community, but not necessarily, you know, uh, recognised in, in 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 a in a traditional sense. Just uh, their influencers, to use the sort of uh, millennial term for it. Um, yeah, you have to you have to take them uh, along in the process. You need to have cons consensus from those people, and and they're the people who can really support you in terms of mapping out an understanding um, where vulnerabilities lie in the community. What are the historical disputes or conflicts or latent disputes within a community? Uh, and understand all of the different power dynamics in the in the areas that you're working, and, and to help you identify people who who might miss out. With, with caution, sometimes traditional leaders, of course, are, are, are um, have vested interests themselves. Uh, but certainly, um, you know, I, in my experience, they're they're um, it, it, it's typically more helpful uh, to work with the grain uh, uh, in in the localities that we work. Thanks, John. Um, does anyone else have thoughts on this, Ariana, Paula, Herbert? Hello, hello. I, I I just want to add um, on the question of uh, the role of traditional leaders in supporting uh, 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 women's land rights, so in help, helping the, with the situation. And I want to give an example of uh, actually land uh, in the northern Uganda. Um, 
for example, in that traditional system, they, 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 they have what they used to call the chief of, of the snail shells. It's because they, it, traditionally women used to weed millet using the shells of the snails. So they had a chief for that, and that that woman would sit in the in the chief's council, and therefore would be able to champion uh, the, the issues around women. She, that is the, the, the you you know. So the, the, there are structures within the traditional systems that had something to do with the the rights of women with regard to to land and uh, and land use the other example i want to give most of some of the customary uh, societies especially in 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 northern uganda uh, men or boys of age when they want to marry they actually get land for for their wives to cultivate via the portion allocated to their mothers so some of they, 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 there are a lot of intricate, interesting things in some of these traditions. But what, 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 the, the bigger problem we have that these nobody has interrogated these processes, nobody has interrogated these systems, and to see whether those are effective safety nets with respect to the right to the land rights of of, of women. So that, that, that's where uh, the, the, the problem is. But but. They do have a role. Whether that role makes mileage for the cause of women with respect to land rights is 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 questionable, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, Ileana, do you have any thoughts? Yeah. Well, thank you, Amanda. I would like to link the first two questions: the role of traditional rules that um, with you know the how to overcome. Um, barriers um, when women are not considered full owners but users because that's most of the case of what happens with forests and just to highlight three points quickly the first is like let us remember that the, there are different levels in terms of where rules like the type of rules that are being in place and as I mentioned you know like we're talking about national laws how they are implemented but also customary systems and how they are like the local bylaws the local norms that are some of them might not even formalize but you know like it's it's really important to look like where are those barriers and what is the role of the different um, actors involved so I think like in terms of promoting the that you know the, the rules that are inclusive this, of course, the, the customary and the local rules are going to have a lot of saying, but in the formalization processes, I think there's also a lot of responsibility of what it's like, how the implementation is taking place. So formalization can be an opportunity, but as I think it was um, Herbert and mentioned, it can also be a risk. So we need to be looking at how this convening is going on, how the marketing is being done, the type of mapping that is being placed, you know, in order not to, um, in, to, 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 to take advantage of the opportunities of formalization and not to perpetuate the type of risk that uh, could happen in terms of deepening inequalities. And related to the second uh, question, um, I think it's very important also to look that the customary systems are highly dynamic. They're not a static systems. They are always in place. So at least what we saw in, in, in the cases that we analyzed is that some of these communal bylaws, some of these customary systems were actually being reviewed during formalization processes. And we saw that in some of these cases, it actually allowed women to participate uh, more actively in the process. Um, and some of them, uh, at least we saw that in three of the 10 uh, communities that we saw in one region in Peru, were able to gain rights from those processes. So I think that we need to be aware of these different situations. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna to switch to a question that's just for one panelist. So uh, John, how do you identify and train SDOs to ensure that they support women's rights while also responding to local norms? Uh, that's a, a great question. Um, so the, uh, an interesting thing from, from Ethiopia is um, 
that I think of, we, we currently employ 28 SDOs. And I think 26 or 27 of them are men. Um, and, we, and we find we, we're really not receiving many applications for the position from, from women. Um, I, there's, there's another subject for, for research, but I, I think in, in, in some ways it uh, works in our favour um, because uh, these, these young men are uh, kind of perceived as not coming with a particular agenda, um, that they're coming uh, to look at the wider community um, so they uh, and, and to look at what well, you know it's it's not just women it's other vulnerable groups it's orphans it's elderly people all kinds of people who, who are vulnerable to being left behind um they uh, and and i i think they they they're well listened to by the predominantly male leaders in in these communities that we work in um these are young people they're graduates um, often they come from our, uh, uh, um, they're sort of um, promoted from within our field team. So they've got a, a good uh, standing knowledge of the different processes already. Uh, and they've, they've worked with communities. And then we train them in house. We have um, uh, something called our SDO guidelines, which are a set of procedures and uh, case studies which uh, our, our teams can, can work from uh, and, and help them, it helps them to, to make decisions in the field. And then of course, they have to go and work directly with communities themselves. Um, they, you know, they, they have to uh, engage with the different local level institutions. Um, in, in, in Ethiopia at, um, at the Kabele level, which is kind of village level, I guess, or a large village. Um, there are a number of, of kind of formal institutions that exist, land administration committees, women's development committees, and so on. So the, the SDO is engaged directly with them and then, and then try and map out where vulnerable people might be found and, 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 and go knocking on doors, really. Uh, so I, uh, sometime soon, I, would, I, I, I hope to kind of turn our SDO guideline into something a little bit more um, digestible. It's a couple of hundred pages right now uh, and, and more, um, uh, more general, uh, which can be shared with, with the wider community and land. So it, it's something that you can keep on your desk in, in, in uh, you know, Malaysia or Kenya or Mozambique or where, wherever you're sitting and, and refer to, and, and perhaps we can share some of the lessons we've learned in Ethiopia that way. Well, that sounds like a great project, <laughs> we did, Han. Um, so I have a question now for the Uganda team. Uh, the general discussion in Uganda indicates that they issue certificates of customary ownership to rural households. Is this process based on demand by holders of customary land or government-initiated program? Should I repeat that? Paul Herbert? Could you repeat the question, please? Yes. Um, so the question is, the general discussion in Uganda indicates that they issue certificates of customary ownership to rural households. Is this process based on demand by holders of customary land or government-initiated programs? Government-initiated land. Hello. Uh, okay. I, I I I hope I got the question right. You are, the question is whether this is on demand or government initiated. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is government initiated. I would say. I would say that uh, for two reasons. One, uh, for a long time in Uganda, they they. The, 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 the dispensation was such that uh, uh, people looked up to freeholds and the leaseholds as the ultimate transformation 
uh, to registration away from unregistered customary lands. But the law, the Land Act, the land policy allow or introduce this mechanism of certificates of uh, customary ownership. And truthfully, if you look at the, if you read the law in the strict sense and the policy, this was intended to be a transitional, a transitional, a transitional mechanism uh, to the to to what at that time would be regarded as higher uh, level registration, which is the freehold. So, to that effect, the the document itself was expected to not involve very complicated processes like we are seeing people implementing right now. So, but the the the, the process is very cheap compared to the formal to the other formal registration processes the drive to implement it more strongly driven by civil society tech on the need to have tenure security i have not read any document anywhere or any report anywhere that talks about community level or household level demand no so it, it, between the, the fact that the process is cheap, very many people think tenure security is important. It can be realized through that option. There is that drive, but it, it is, I wouldn't put uh, my finger on community or demand driven need for that initiative. Okay, thank you, Herbert. So now um, a question about unintended consequences. Has any of you seen any unintended negative consequences based on this work with improving rights? Um, an example is mentioned about women being subject to GBV based on their participation in things like a two hour M&E interview. So anyone have any unintended negative consequences to share or thoughts on that? I, 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 I wonder whether there are some, you know, we will see some, uh, but, you know, I mean, I don't know, and I don't even know if this is, could be considered a negative consequence or not, but, you know, if, if, um, if women feel more secure in their land rights, um, might they be more, and th this is a question, I don't, I don't have any data to support this or anything like that, it's, a, you know, uh, just speculation. Um, might they be more inclined to um, leave their husbands? Uh, might they be more inclined to uh, get out of a bad relationship? Um, and you know what? What is the uh, you know what? What is the p possible negative consequences of that, or uh, perceived by by wider society uh, a negative consequence? Would there be a backlash? against having women named uh, on uh, 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 improving women's land rights because of a fear that it may erode the traditional family unit. Um, so that's the question that I often discuss with colleagues in the, in the car when I'm out in the field. Um, another, another thing which I, uh, again, and I, I don't have any data to support this, but I remember speaking, working in the, in the Caribbean uh, uh, about 15 years ago in Guyana, where there was um, a lot of people looking to leave the country to move to the United States and Canada, um, were, were receiving their um, security of tenure, receiving their, uh, I think it was 50-year uh, leases or 99-year leases, I can't remember, um, and, and asking me the question, do you think this will help me secure a visa to go to the United States? Um, which is, which is not really the desired outcome. Uh, so I wonder how many of those people took their salon certificates down to the US embassy or the Canadian embassy. Um, and then another thing I think we have to be mindful of is, is there's an assumption that, you know, people will get land rights and then they'll go out and use it 
as collateral and uh, obtain a loan. And I think that is a great idea. Um, and uh, but I think uh, there's a need alongside that for uh, improved financial literacy um, and the right kind of loan products to be in place, which don't put people at unnecessary risk. Um, you don't want somebody to go out and you know buy a huge combine harvester uh, 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 um, uh, and, and find that they can't pay it back. Um, so. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's just some food for thought there, not not necessarily rooted in experience so much as just observations. Thanks, John. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts on unintended negative consequences? Um, well, thanks, Amanda. I I wanted to share an example of something we saw in Peru in an indigenous community, and that was one particular community where there was a rule that for, you know, like for anybody wanting to marry somebody from outside the community, if it was a man, uh, the woman from outside the community would be allowed to stay. And she would be kind of on probation um, to see whether, you know, the rest of the community would accept it, but she would be um, finally, um, you know, like accepted to stay in the community versus if a woman from the community would be interested in marrying somebody from outside, she would have to leave and therefore she would lose her rights to the communal rights that she got. So during the formalization process, there was a discussion like women were actually able to discuss among themselves what this meant and challenge collectively um, whether this rule I mean, the, the fairness of the rule being applied only for men and they would they being allowed to marry somebody from outside, but not the women. So, you know, like at, at the end, there was some negotiation across within the community of, of how they would challenge and they would review this communal bylaw. But I will also say that in some cases, unintended consequences would be related to the kind of pressures that they have. For instance, this community, the community was very well located. There was a lot of pressure coming, not only from the existing roads, but also from accessing the community for interests related to forests, but also to mining. So I would say that, you know, like we need to make sure um, of how, you know, the type of pressures that, that happen, you know, like, and, and that will allow us to understand better the type of consequences, unintended consequences this could have. Thank you, Eliana. Um, anyone else? Uh, I'll move on. Okay, so another question here is how can gender mainstreaming in land reform be monitored? A bit about. Um, I, I think, could I pick that up from, from, yes, from the. Pres the large scale uh, land registration perspective. Um, I, I, as I said before, we, we can't um, look underneath everybody's bed uh, when we're registering uh, um, systematically. Um, so we, we can't really get into detail about household dynamics and things like that, which is a shame because I think those are really interesting things to study. Um, and, and, and certainly we you know, we should be conducting surveys and research into those things that inform our approach to the registration for sure. And, you know, bring in that very important uh, contextual analysis. In terms of um, pushing ahead and uh, registering systematically thousands of parcels a day, we, what we can look at is, is um, how people are are claiming land, so um, whether they're registering jointly or uh, as private individuals, depending on the prevailing tenure regime. Uh, we can ask questions about the, the means of acquisition. So is this family land that's been inher inherited or has it been purchased or exchanged? Um, and we can, we can even look at whether, uh, you know, um, parcels are being clay, uh, kind of recorded in, in sort of complex households. So you see, see the same husband appearing with lots of different women on different parcels and, and, and perhaps that would, would indicate that there's um, 
you know, a polygamous household situation. So I think these are all things that you need to be monitoring and, and looking at very closely. You also need to be able to look, look at the, the size of a holding um, uh, in terms of the number of parcels that a household or an individual might be claiming, and also the size of those parcels to determine whether, uh, you know, there is, this, there's an equitable balance there. Um, you know, the, I, I, one of the biggest landholders in the world is Her Majesty the Queen. Um, and <laughs> so she kind of skews the, skews the statistics a little bit um, when, it com when it comes to, you know, fe females with land rights, because I think she's, she's got some, still has some domain over big parts of Canada, right? <laughs> and huge chunks of the UK. So um, we have to be careful not to be uh, skewing our own statistics. We have to be careful that we're, we're measuring the same things. And that just because there are many women named on parcels doesn't mean to say that they have access to a lot of land. They may have smaller parcels. The parcels may be more dispersed. Um, we have to we have to look at those kind of dynamics, and that that's possible uh, from the kind of data that we collect. It requires an investment in land information systems. Um, that requires a bit of project management as well, because that's a, essentially an IT approach, and um, those of us involved in the land sector are not always the uh, the right people to be managing IT projects, right? So you need to bring in some specialist support there. Um, Thanks, I've gone on long enough. Uh, let my colleagues respond. Thanks, John. Uh, does anyone else have any thoughts? Paula Herbert, do you have thoughts maybe on yes, monitoring? Yes, I, 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 I have uh, two, two points to raise on that. Um, it, is, it is very possible to, to, to monitor gender mainstreaming. Uh, you can uh, look at the gender mainstreaming from the point of the land information systems. Uh, particularly if these are developed in a manner uh, that allows uh, input from various stakeholders, such that uh, the, 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 the variables that come up uh, uh, make sense to, 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 to being able to interrogate matters concerning gender mainstreaming. But most important as well, because LIS is fall into the arena of administrative data, the, the having a, a very clear pathway for, for, for scholars and others interested to be able to interrogate those systems. Is there a mechanism by which people can actually reach out to the uh, LIS, the land information system, and be able to interpret on various things? But aside from that, we also need to approach it from the, the point of the different actors, especially can some data, meaningful data uh, collection processes be implemented prior and after to the mainstreaming actions? B because uh, not all the actors uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the different mainstreaming processes actually do have an interest in, in the data collection, in interrogating these processes, in seeing the effect of these processes. So that, that, that is important. Can, can there be that level of investment, that level of interest in periodic look and review at these processes? So it is it, that it so it can be achieved, but this is something that requires government, civil society uh, partnerships such that the government is willing to open up the LIS and these other processes to be interrogated by people. But at the same time, the civil society and other actors take the responsibility to say, we need to collect data periodically as far as these processes are concerned. And can this data be opened up as public good? So a lot of gender mainstreaming in land management and administration has happened, but these processes are not open to public interrogation. That, that, and that is a limitation. Thanks, thanks, that's a good observation. Um, Ileana, did you have anything to add or I'll move on? 
Well, thank you, Amanda. Just to add, and I really support um, what Herbert just said, and in the role of, of civil society and uh, having these partnerships, like for us in Peru and, and also in Indonesia, uh, the, the social organizations, indigenous movements, customary peoples were highly organized. But also just to remember, like this go back to the type of mechanism in place. We need to understand what are the targets to know what specifically we're going to monitor. And also, you know, like in some cases, uh, for some organizations, this is, not, this is not only about mainstreaming, but actually about making sure that these reforms are gender responsive. And there is a lot of women organizations as well, indigenous, customary, and civil society women's organizations that are actually demanding to ensure that these reforms are um, considering women's concerns and needs from the upfront in the design process to make sure that the implementation mechanisms actually, you know, derive the outcomes, um, the, the outcomes and the goals of these reforms. Thanks, Eliana. And I think that leads to an interesting question that's come in, which is how are women included substantively in designing programs to test the assumption that certificates or documents are the best way to strengthen women's rights in practice? Um, so does anyone have any thoughts on this, on including women substantively in the design? Uh, maybe just quickly to add some of our results from an analysis that we did with only agents of implementation. This was mainly governments at the national, subnational, different sectors. And the truth, at least from what we saw um, in the three countries that we analyzed, is that, you know, like out of 10 uh, people involved in implementation, only two were women. So this is very, very slow. And this was not only in terms of implementation, but also in the design. Um, so there, so there is different ways in which we can involve women in the design. One of them is just to ensure that we have women's organizations. Another one is just to have, you know, like the skills and the training in place. So the those involved in implementation, whether they are men or women, are having these considerations in mind when they're doing the work. Thanks. Uh, does anyone else have thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I, I can I can speak to a little bit to how uh, large scale programs uh, are designed, and I, I, it kind of falls into two halves really. It, if you're looking at it in terms of um, you know how how the, the program is structured overall, then that's very much you know a lot of that is a political decision. A lot of that is driven by the donors. Um, there isn't a great deal of participation, to be honest. There's consultation and, and this, this kind of thing. Um, so that really, are women involved in that process? Depends who's the minister at the time. Um, in Rwanda, yes. In Ethiopia, no. Um, in terms of how uh, the pr process and procedures work on the ground, so in terms of how the the people experience the land registration process, then there, there is quite a lot of participation from women from the wider community, from uh, people from, from villages have an input into the, the process. They're um, required to participate, <coughs> excuse me, um, but also, you know, people give feedback uh, and, and we learn how to improve those processes based on what we find in the field. I think, and it's important that teams that are project teams that are delivering this kind of work also give priority to having a, um, uh, a social inclusion specialist on the team, somebody who's looking specifically at gender as well on the team. Um, I was surprised to, to hear from some colleagues that that was not always the case on, on, on uh, registration projects. Um, but, you know, very often these uh, are processes that have a very kind of, geo the priority is geotechnical, if you like. Um, and certainly for the projects that I've been involved in implementing, uh, the role of a, of a Jesse advisor on the team is critical and you need that person there. Even if you can't afford to have 28 SDOs on your team, you still need somebody on your team. That person needs to needs to be sitting down 
with the management and leadership of those teams and, and, and making sure that their, their concerns and their ideas are heard. Hello, uh, I, want to, I want to add a, a, a comment to, first of all, I, I, I agree with John that uh, the, the, as far as design is concerned, there the, the is a, it, it's questionable there, the, 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 the extent which women are included at that level. But I, I want to talk a little bit more about the, the, the aspect of implementation. We all know there is this uh, affirmative action, a third representation on land management and administration institutions, the area land committees, the district land boards, even the adjudication teams on the ground. That a third representation is standard pretty much. But I want to raise the point of effective inclusion and the token inclusion, uh, because we actually do not have data that tells us that that a third representation is actually effective inclusion for the women. Why? Because the dispossessions for women still happen. Uh, uh, land transactions that should actually be family sanctioned still happen without the family sanction. So it raises the, 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 the bitter uh, pill to swallow whether this is effective inclusion in, on these bodies or token inclusion where the women are there, but we don't actually see uh, the, the service delivery being women responsive, if I may use that kind of language. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Herbert. So I think we have come basically to the end of our time. Um, so thanks to everyone for your participation and thanks to everyone who's called in. Um, it's really been an interesting conversation. So we will have a recording available in the next few days um, and a report on the discussion coming in the, in the next few weeks. And in that report, I think we'll include some of these questions that we didn't get to from the audience. Um, so not to worry, your question will actually be the light of day. Um, so thanks again to everyone, and I hope everyone has a great day.